Okay, so I do have us live, Sandy, uh, and okay. like I said, we'll record. Um, now that we got the recording thing all straightened out, <laughs> we're good. So, all right, all right. I want to. I know people are still popping on, so I just want to. Oh, I give it another minute. <laughs> I don't like to let start too early, but I don't want to start late either. So, I'll give us. So yeah, I'm seeing a, a lot of new names on, on here too. So welcome. Okay. All right. And Sandy, just so you know, we have about half uh, participation so far. So people will just still trickle in. So I think, you know, that's that's pretty good. I'm excited. So uh, good evening, everybody. I want to introduce myself. I'm Susan M. Hart Servideo from the Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Ocean County. And uh, with me tonight is Patty uh, Dixon, also from our office in Ocean County. Um, she's one of our other horticulturists. And we're going to be um, helping Miss uh, Sandra, Mrs. <laughs> Sandy Holmes, on her um, giving this presentation to this evening. And I just really want to thank you all for for taking the opportunity. I know there's quite a few people that are um, outside of Jersey that'll be on tonight. And um, welcome. I, you know, it's it's nice to I was just saying it's nice to be able to reach out and uh, reach out some other garden enthusiasts. So we'll go from there. Um, as I mentioned before, your microphones and videos are turned off. Um, you can ask your questions in the Q and A. There, there's a little. Uh, it says Q at the Q and. Uh, a time uh, so you can put your answer your questions in there you won't see the answers or, or you won't see the questions until patty or myself answer and it goes out then to everybody um so without further ado um i'd like to introduce uh sandy holmes of riverbend daily um gardens in bellbrook ohio and that is uh north ohio no it's it's pretty much sort of west central kind west of central. it's but it's between columbus and cincinnati okay oh. okay <laughs> well um sandy started uh as uh, being a backyard daily hybridizer in 1995 and she had her first daily hybrid registered um with the american um Hemorrhocala society which is also now called the american Daily Society, and uh, in 2005, and she's a garden judge and a garden judge instructor for the society. So, um, which in the United States there are 15 regions that uh, encompass a few different uh, states. So, I'm going to let Sandy then uh, take it away, and I thank you, Sandy, for joining us this evening. Thank you. Uh, we're. Uh, I refer to. Our garden is a, a a hobby run amok. We started out just playing with daylilies, and the more I did it, the more I loved it. So what I'm going to do tonight is kind of walk you through some of the things that I've learned about daylilies, and then show you how I spend my time. So what is a daylily? Almost everybody that says, oh, I have the daylily, it's a bulb that does this, this, and this. And I say to them, no, you have a true lily. The day lily in this picture is on the right and it's full of all those little roots. So that's a day lily versus the true lily. Um, tetraploid and diploids. For the average gardener, it doesn't make a bit of difference. You get a flower you like and you grow it. For people who hybridize, it makes a huge difference because there's a difference in the number of chromosomes. And a diploid and a tetraploid normally are not compatible. As you can see on the picture, there's something called a triploid down at the bottom. And every once in a while, you can cross a diploid with a triploid and get a tetraploid. But you got to be crazy scientific to even know you're doing it. So I would say for the average person in this room, don't worry about it. If you, in my case, I find diploids that I like, and since I only do tets, I sometimes have them converted so that I can use the pollen. This is where it all started out. All of, all of the daylilies started in Asia and that area, and they were called fulva. If you look at the one in the middle, that's what is commonly referred to as the ditch lily in almost all of the Midwest and the South, because 
it grows in almost every ditch someplace in every county. So I don't know whether there's a lot of ditch lilies in New Jersey or not, but that's the one that came over, I would say, with most of the pioneers. Uh, sort of the background, in Europe, George Watt uh, yelled, uh, really got into daylilies in 1877. And he actually won an award for apricot, which is still available, believe it or not, in uh, 1892. And then in England, a fellow named Amos Perry started collecting, and the two gentlemen hybridized up until the, the 1930s. So they were the early European hybridizers. In the US, uh, a Harrington started with the first hybrid. And that one, I, I don't see that very often, but I think it is still available. But the guy that's sort of known for daylilies in the US is Arlo Stout. And he was at the New York Botanical Garden and he started hybridizing there. And uh, he just became very well known. And finally, the uh, <laughs> the botanical garden told him he had to get out. And so he, he met with Bertram Farr, who was in the Midwest, and he, Bertram, was going to grow all of his seedlings and market his flowers for him. And the unfortunate part is shortly after they put the, together their deal, Bertram Farr died, but the new owner who took over his business did all of Stout stuff for him. So Stout is probably the one that if you hear about daylilies and you're not familiar with them, Stout would be the name you would hear the most in the U.S. Uh, in 1945, a, a bunch of daylily people in the Midwest formed the Midwest Hemorrhocallus Society, which 10 years later evolved into the American Hemorrhocallus Society. And Stout, who was active all along, died in 57. So yeah, that was a, a huge loss to the daylily world. So this is kind of there. I teach garden judging, and there's things that in that that help people to evaluate daylilies. And what I'm going to do is hit on some of those in detail, and others just for now we'll just kind of skip over them. So color, color is very subjective. I could love a color that you would look at and say that is the ugliest color I have ever seen. So color is very subjective. I personally like good, what I call clean colors. So you, you get a yellow that's yellow, not necessarily one that has brown in the background. Uh, but color is subjective and everybody likes their own. Form we're going to go over in detail in a little bit. Substance is how the daylily holds up during the course of the day. So some daylilies are beautiful in the morning and look like wet tissue paper at the end of the day. So they have very poor substance. If you're, but like my case, I select my flowers in the evening because that's when most people see them. So you, you really want to make sure that when you have a when you buy a flower, you get something that you can enjoy in the evening. Even if it's beautiful in the morning, if it looks awful in the evening, don't mess with it. We're going to go over branching and bud count and foliage a little later. Distinction is what makes this daylily different from another. It could be it's the most unique color you've ever seen. It could be you have never seen branching and bud count like that any place. It could be that, wow, this has an edge on it that I have never seen before. And it, I have a flower that I use as an example. Uh, it's a flower that's named for my father and it's a big purple daylily with a good green throat, but it's four feet tall and branched really, really well and doesn't fall down in the wind. That's what makes that flower distinctive. It's not the color, it's not the form, it's the scape that's holding it up. So distinction just means it's different than something else and it could be the color of the foliage, it could be anything. But distinction is one of those things that, shall we say a flower is, is sort of rated on. And then you wanna look at the complete plant, which would be the foliage, the scape, 
and the bloom. And you want to make sure that the flower, you know, is good during the day, that the foliage looks good in the spring and good in the fall. There's a lot of foliage that will kind of turn brown on you before it's dying. It'll get streaks in it and, and just not be as attractive. And then we're going to hit on vigor and then overall performance. I think as we go, you'll, you'll see what that means. So, uh, we're going to talk about the flower next, because that's the thing that really draws you to the plant. Sandy, can you, oh, never mind. Yeah, you put it on ahead. there. Nope, you got it. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> okay, the flower criteria. And this is again sort of from the garden judging. How it opens. So do you if you have a flower that locks up while it's opening and you got to go through and flip it with your finger to get the thing to come apart, that's not necessarily a good thing. You want to walk out and see the whole thing blooming. The length of the bloom, and that would be not the length of one day, but do you have a flower that's going to bloom over the course of a week, two weeks, three weeks? And those are dependent on a lot of different things. Substance we've talked about, fragrance. There used to be lots and lots of fragrant daylilies, and you can barely find them now. They've gotten, it's been just bred out of them. Once in a while, something will pop up, but you just don't know. And then weather resistance. When it rains, does your flower get dots and spots? Does it melt away? In my case, because I do unusual forms and they're kind of long and stringy, and I have to breed for wind resistance. Because if it gets really windy, it can blow all of the petals and sepals off the flower. So you don't think about wind resistance. You think about rain, but that's just another one of the, the things that you have to consider attractiveness of the color and or if there's a pattern and the form of the petals and sepals basically what what people have have wanted for years is that the petals and the sepals will open i'll call them flat that they don't bend up and canoe uh, and things like that well over the course of time some of the things that were considered faults in the day lilies have become unique and people like them. So again, day lilies go to the individual's taste. There is no right or wrong, but I think most of us know when we see an ugly flower. <laughs> All right, flower parts. Basically you have the petals, which are the big ones, and the sepals, which are the smaller ones. The petals are on top, the sepals are on the bottom. Uh, when you hybridize, you're interested in the uh, other flower parts. So you can see where the uh, little arrows point. The pistil is the long skinny thing that sticks out in the middle. That's where the pollen goes. Uh, the stamen is where you're going to get your, or it's going to hold the pollen. And the anther has there's the little thing at the top where all the pollen is. And then the ovary is way down in, and that's where the uh, the pollen will go. And hopefully, as over on the left hand side, you'll get a seed pod. And if you're looking at that saying, I've never seen a black seed pod. The only ones I've ever seen are green. I have a flower that would, uh, if it's in the background, almost always throws black seed pods. <laughs> it goes back to twist of lemon. And then there's the throat. And the throat can be any place from orange to yellow to green or in a blending of all of those, but you want the, the color of the throat to complement the flower. And that's also where all the little frogs hide. And then these are the, the six basic forms of daylilies. You have the single, which is three petals and three sepals. You have the double which can be a whole bunch of stuff. There's lots of different kinds of doubles, but there's more tissue in the double. And then you have the polys, and the polys basically, instead of having three and three, have four and four. Spiders, 
there's a measurement that for every four inches, it can be one inch across, and we'll we'll go over that later. Unusual forms, which are basically, I call them open flowers. You can see between the petals and the sepals. And then sculpted, and sculpt is, is a relatively new term, and there's lots of different kinds of sculpted, and some of the stuff has gotten to be very, very interesting. Unusual forms. Pristate, which basically is pinched cascade, which is like a ribbon, and spatula. So if you think about a spatula, it's long and skinny and pops out at the top. So that's what the spatula is. And that, with an unusual form, in order to register it that way, it has to have all three petals or all three sepals exhibit the form. And it's entirely possible that you could have the three petals exhibit something different than the three sepals. So you would pretend that we're going to register a cascading spatula <laughs> or a cascading crispate. But they, they're forms and they have to be consistent. If you have two that do it and one that doesn't, you're not supposed to register it. It can look different every day, and the flower may look different in the morning than it does in the afternoon. And now, the sizes. Most of the sizes go are, are driven by judging. And I don't know if any of you realize that there are shows where people bring daylilies in and they are judged, and you get winners. And this is one of the categories, is a miniature. So it has to be three inches or less. And it doesn't make any difference what size the scape is. So miniature, you could have a three inch flower on a 14 inch or a 14, a 48 inch scape, and it's still a miniature. A small flower is more than three, but less than four and a half. You'll notice I've got some Steve Williams stuff. He's a a hybridizer in this area who grows lovely, lovely small flowers. And then a large flower, that's 4.5 or greater. And I think it's really supposed to be 4.5 to 7, but that's not the way it was written the last time. So you can see these are bigger flowers. The, the problem with pictures is you have no perspective on the size of the flower. <laughs> And then extra large, uh, these are seven inches or greater, but they can't have been registered as any other category. So if I had a, a 10 inch spider and they took it to the show, it would have to be in the spider category. It would not be an extra large diameter flower. And now we're gonna get into sort of colors. A self is everything about the flower is the same color. Now you can see that in the throats, there's, there's some green. That doesn't necessarily have to count as the flower. Everybody realizes that the throat will be a little bit different color, but you can see that you know, on, on the yellow one, especially the pistols, the stamens, that it's yellow everywhere. It's a little harder to see on the one that's pink, but the, the pistols and the stamens and all of those are pink too. So that's a self. A blend is colors intermingled. And I've seen orange and yellow blends, um, pink and cream are very, very, uh, you see that a lot, but a blend is just, you don't see one color in the flower, you see many. Now you can see on this one big one that the edge is a different color. That's not really what they're talking about with the blend, it's what's going on in the petals and the sepals. And bold eyes. Now most people think of eyes as a solid color. But the, what I'm showing here are all considered eyes. And it has to have to be an eye. The pattern has to appear 
on the petals and the sepals. Watermarks are an eye in reverse. An eye is darker than the, the rest of the flower. A watermark is lighter than the rest of the flower. So you almost think about it as a reverse eye. And you can see in there, there's, you know, there's lots of different colors in there. Some of them are uh, like the first flower there is a, uh, a, a lavender purple, but the eye is almost white. Pattern day lilies has been the, the new thing over the last 10 years. And it started out that the, in the South, they could generate lots and lots of patterns. But when we brought them North, the patterns didn't hold. And we, we over time sort of said, well, there must be heat sensitive patterns. So if it's really hot, the pattern would show. If it was really cool, the pattern would not. And as the hybridizers worked in the North, it started to reverse. The, uh, when, the, when it was cool at night, the patterns were more dominant in the day than when it was warm at night. So there's there are a lot of stable patterns now where 10, 12 years ago, you never knew if you were gonna see a pattern, even if you bought a flower that was patterned in all the time. And I, I talked about polys being four and four. One of the easiest ways to tell if a flower is a poly is there will be only one pistil. If there's two pistils, it's a fused bloom. So that means that as it was developing, two flowers fused together and developed as if it was one. But a poly truly has only one pistil. So that's just a FYI. Now this is an area that I just love. I love the bitones, the bicolors, and I have to tell you I'm a, a sucker for a watermark. <laughs> The bicolor is the petals and the sepals are a different color. So you can see the petal on this one is, is more of a pinky kind of color, but the sepals are yellow. And then on the opposite side, on the right side is a bitone. So it's a dark reddish pink and a light reddish pink. The one at the bottom is a reverse bitone. So the flower is lighter and the petals are darker. So they're all bitones, but they're just different kinds. Okay, questions. Surely there'll be one question after all of that. <laughs> one of the questions that came through from Kathleen was about the soil temperature. Can soil temperature affect the pattern dailies beyond just the ambient temperature. Do you know off the top of your head? I don't know, but I have not observed that it does. Now there may be a scientific study somewhere, but I have found that just the ambient temperature, you know, it, it, the soil temperature won't change much overnight, but you could have one day where it's 75 degrees, the temperature drops down at night to 55 degrees and then pops up in the middle of the day at 75 again, and that will impact the color of your flower and how it opens and all that kind of stuff. Okay, and then we had the, oh, no, we're talking about the prolonged, the, the question that came in from Roberta early on. I don't know if you wanna answer that one or wait till we get a little further along about prolonging the life of the daylilies. Um, let's, let's take that one when we get into the scapes. Okay. Okay, okay, now we're going to Good talk supper. about the other parts of the daylily that make that pretty face nice. Foliage. This is without a doubt the most controversial part of, I'll call it the hybridizing daylily world. There are basically three kinds of foliage. There's evergreen, which tries to grow year round and does very well in the south and can do very well in the north, depending on whether it's under six inches of snow or <laughs> there's a, the dormant day or the dormant day lilies 
which have like a blue green foliage. And I'm sorry, but my picture does not show that as blue green, but it really is. And it can take a drop in temperature, even to freezing, and it doesn't really impact the daylily unless it's gotten up where, you know, it's like a foot and a half tall. When it gets that big, it will be impacted. The semi evergreen or semi dormant, whatever you want to call it, will grow. It won't turn into a pile of mush because it's not going to grow year round, but the temperature can burn the tips. And it grows out of it. The, in six weeks, all of this foliage that I'm showing here in this picture, you won't be able to tell any of that has happened. Um, the ADS a few years ago said that dormant should be deciduous. And they finally, because so many people told them they were crazy, let us continue to use dormant because we all said deciduous is a tree. <laughs> but that's just one of those things. Um, there's a lot of people within the society that thinks that, you know, in the north, you shouldn't grow anything but dormant daylilies and that evergreens are bad. If you go to the south, dormants don't do well at all. The evergreens do wonderfully, and the semi-evergreens, you just don't know unless you've been there. So I'm a firm believer in the next one, hardy. <laughs> it doesn't matter what kind of plant you have, as long as it lives where you're growing it. And uh, some plants really are very sensitive to cold temperatures or to hot temperatures. And if you can find a flower that can grow from the Gulf Coast to Canada, then you have a hardy, hardy flower everywhere. Most can't do that. Uh, the, the things that we grow in the Midwest, when you take them down into Texas and places like that, they just don't do well at all. I remember seeing one of my flowers growing in uh, Louisiana, and I wanted to cry. I was so distressed that this garden was on tour and this horrible looking flower was there and it's beautiful up here <laughs> but the most important thing is that if you're buying daylilies buy things that other people have told you will grow well in your area because you cannot predict it you can't buy a flower out of florida and know if it will live in minnesota any more than you can buy a flower in minnesota and know that it'll live in florida now we're going to talk a little bit about scapes. The height and the strength of the scape should be proportionate to the flower and the plant. Now that sounds really nice, doesn't it? But basically what it's telling you is that if your foliage is two feet tall, you don't want to have a scape that's 18 inches. And if you have 18 inch foliage, or 18 inch foliage, then you need a scape that puts the flower above the foliage. And it might be above by three inches, six inches, whatever, but it should look nice. And that's that's really the key. You want the scapes to be placed well within the flower. You don't want them all stuck in the middle running together. So you want them spread out throughout the whole plant. And then you want enough buds and or scapes for a long blooming period. And we'll, we'll get into that a little more when we start talking about the scapes. And then you want at the top, you want the branching and the bud count to allow for adequate spacing for the bloom to open. I'm sure all of you have seen a flower where all the blooms are in the top. Some of them can't open at all because the thing next to it opened first and is laying on top, that's not anything that you're gonna enjoy in your garden. So when we get into scapes, I'll show you kind of how to avoid that. All right, scapes, branching. This is without a doubt the best drawing I have ever seen because people for years argued over what branching was. And I can tell you that there's probably somebody out there that introduced that as, oh, I don't know, like a 12-way branching, and it's not. 
the main, let's see if I can do this with the, this is the main branch right here. And anything that comes off of that is considered a branch. So here's branch number one, but see how it's split here? Those are just sub branches. This is the main branch. Here's branch number two, again, just a sub branching. Here's number three, number four, number five, and number six. So this is a six way branching. And here's a picture of it down here. This is very important for the number of blooms. Generally speaking, the more branched it is, the more blooms you're going to have. You have to be careful, like I would say up in here, depending on the size of the flower, you may get a lot of overlap and the flowers might not open as well. I like three and four way branching because it tends to allow the flowers to open better. But that is just, again, my personal opinion. And it's only worth it to me. <laughs> Dormant daylilies take longer to mature than evergreens because they basically shut down in the winter. What I've got there are two scapes from the same flower. And I've been wanting to prove this for years. And by accident this year, I still had scapes that hadn't gotten pulled in the seedling field. So the one on the left is the scape from last year. The one on the right is the scape from this year. It's from the same plant. So you can see what another year of growing for a dormant daylily did for that plant. And I've got a yardstick next to it, so it's more than 36 inches tall. So again, if you look sometimes on a plant, you'll see that one of them be five-way branched and then be another that'll be two-way branched. The only reason it's like that is that the second one is the immature scape. And the following year, it probably will be very, very much improved. The other thing that impacts the scapes is the weather. So if as the scapes are developing in the spring, you've been having I will call it 60 degree days and it drops down to 30 at night or it snows or something like that, your early bloomers are going to be really impacted and the scapes will probably not be as nice as they've been in the past. But following year, they'll be fine again. But the weather, when the weather gets wacky in the middle of the scape development, it really impacts the scapes. I know this year we had a, a funky spring and i have things that have had beautiful scapes on them that were just miserable this year and if i had walked by them as i was making final selections i never would have introduced them but i know that they're good plants so it was just it was the timing of the weather and you can see the three different sizes there of the scapes so that's not anything that's shall we say really important but the bigger the flower the sturdier the scape needs to be so if you have a small flower it'll do just fine on a little bitty scape it won't fall over but if the little bitty scape in the middle was holding a an unusual form that was 12 inches i can guarantee you it would be on the floor or the ground i guess all right now you want to talk about how many blooms you're going to get well, the, the first scape there at the bottom, that will have a lot of blooms. So you've got a branch here, you've got some stuff going on, oops, over here. This one is kind of all run together, but I can tell you having used this flower and, and I, you know, it's an introduction, they don't all open at once. So that one does just fine. But the more buds you have on the scape, the more flowers you're going to have. Um, before we started, I was was telling Susan that I had a, a little diploid one time when I first got started, and it was well branched. It had about 20 buds, and it would bloom five flowers a day over six days, and then it was done. 
you know, it, it would bloom, it would have a little break, it would bloom, it made a beautiful bouquet, and it was really good compost. Now, the, the one at the top, that's Stella Diora. You can see it's a little tiny thing, there's hardly anything to it, but that little devil will bloom all summer. The one down here has got lots and lots of, of spent buds, you know, that, that one will bloom for a long period of time too. So rebloom is really important if you don't have a lot of buds on the scape. There are a lot of people who are who hybridize for rebloom. So it will bloom, it'll rest for a little while, and it'll bloom again. So as you're trying to plan your garden, rebloom is always good. But there's also something that you could think about is daylilies bloom early, mid, and late. And there's early, early, and early, mid, and all that stuff in between. But as you're planning your garden, you want to look to see when the flower blooms. I had a flower that I introduced years ago that liked to start blooming the middle of July or of June. And it would bloom until the end of August, but it never rebloomed. It increased very easily and it would send up new scapes all through the summer on the new growth. So it never rebloomed because I thought, how in the world can it bloom that long? Others are, um, they bloom early and they're done. And so you want to get something else that's going to take over when that one stops. So always as you're looking at plants, look to see when they bloom so that you'll know that you're going to get a variety of bloom times from them. Okay, hopefully I got the question. I think, well, we'll see if, if Roberta uh, puts it back in there for you. Um, we do uh, the question, sorry. Uh, go ahead, Patty, you had one. Uh, Rosemary wanted to know if there's any daylily that is deer resistant. <laughs> no. <laughs> if there was, somebody yep. could make millions of dollars. <laughs> millions. <laughs> Unfortunately, got to keep it. Let's work on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There yes, are some, <laughs> there are some things that you can use um, that will will kind of make the deer stay away. Um, I have been lucky that the deer haven't decided we're food. We have enough corn and soybeans and stuff around us that that we really have not had an issue. But I have a lot of friends who hybridize who've had to put you know like ten foot fences around their the things that day lilies, once the deer decide their food, you're done. Yeah, yeah. I have heard that mill, um, mill organite, which is a fertilizer, they don't like the smell of it, and that will kind of repel them until, I guess, until they decide that they'd rather have the, the flower than the, then they can deal with the smell. But that, I've had people tell me that that will work for them. Um, one of the other, and then I'll let you, um, can we prune the scapes to get them to grow hardier the following year? No. I just, I figured I'd let you answer that one. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It, it doesn't make any difference. And I've also had people say, well, I cut the foliage back as soon as the bloom is over and it won't kill the daylilies. I'm a firm believer in the foliage is what makes them strong for the winter. And I let all of mine die back and let them be the insulation. So the foliage is the insulation for the winter and I clean it up in the spring. But if you have a home, you're not gonna want all that stuff laying around. But I tell people never ever cut your foliage back because that's, that's what's feeding the plant and it will take all its energy to grow more foliage and it won't be prepared for the winter. And that's not scientific, that's observation from a hybridizer. Because when rust f first came up, everybody, as soon as they'd see rust, they'd cut the plants back. And in, within two years, any plant that, that was getting rust 
would be dead and not from the rust. It was from the inability to grow. That's a good, that's a good observation. We don't have that much problem here in New Jersey with the rust this year. We seem to have found it more, um, or at least in my garden, I do, but, um, with our winters, uh, yeah. it should hopefully, you know, but the, with all those Southern storms, we had the winds blew the spot. It's, it's here. Yep. Uh, one last and I'll yep. let you, I'll let you go ahead and continue on. But, um, somebody was asking if you have a reblooming, well, you may get it into it, uh, when you're talking about pollen but if you have a reblooming daily next to a one time bloom will they cross pollinate it, like daylilies can a bee can make lots of new seed and it, yes they can cross pollinate as long as it's, they're diploids and you know diploids to diploids and tetraploids to tetraploids you can get bee pods all over the place it doesn't make any difference whether it's rebloom or not okay and then a couple others but i think you'll get into that so we'll we'll okay. let you continue on i'm going a little longer than i thought i would i apologize okay measuring day lilies and I'm not going to read you all this stuff through. It'll be nice, you know, if somebody wants to read it later. But basically, you measure from the end of the petal to the end of the sepal. And that's how you do it. And that determines the length. You don't lay it down. You don't do anything. You just measure from the top to the bottom. If you have an unusual form, it's the same thing. And you can see how this flower is folded under. Well, this is what you do when they're folded under. You measure them just like they were as they stand, and then you can do wingspan, which is not necessarily uh, something that the AHS touts. But if I have a flower that's 11 inches and I measure it and it's seven inches, I want people to know that it's really a bigger flower. It's just the way that it lays when it opens. So that's wingspan in the wingspan you get to take and lay everything out so you take the petals and you you make it flat and you take the sepal and you make it flat and you measure what it is from side to side but you only measure day lilies as they stand and and because i need to know if i see my hand in the picture i know it's wingspan versus the other side and then spiders are measured a little differently. They have to have a ratio of four to one. And so you measure the widest point on the petal, and then you go up into where the, um, the V shape is in the sepal, and you would measure that down from, they call it the, the notch there down to the end of the, uh, the petal. So that's how you get your ratio. And there's a, if you go to the AHS site, they have a little thing where you don't have to do the calculations. You just measure it and look and it tells you what you got. Okay, any more questions? That was a quick one. I know you can and see my mouth. Quite a, go, ahead. go ahead, Patty. There are quite a few questions here. Okay. Um, so why do the leaves turn yellow when the daylilies bloom? It, it generally, it can be a number of things. It could be some kind of a predator in the foliage. It could be a lack of a nutrient in the soil. It could be, in, in some cases, frost damage as the foliage is developed. But generally speaking, I find that it has to do with not having the right nutrients in the soil and it you know you you just take your soil and send it into the what it, we around here it's like the farm bureau kind of thing and they'll tell you what you need um but there's a lot of pests now that are uh getting into the foliage and that can cause that to happen too there's also sometimes there's just a, a, the foliage is just deficient it will do that everywhere, no matter what. I had a flower that I had lined out ready to introduce. And uh, one year, all the foliage had brown streaks in it and I dug it all up and threw it away. 
because I I don't want that out there. You know, it just there must have been something in the the weather that year, but it was it just looked awful. But most of the time, my problem it, it relates to the weather. You know, it's it it got too cold, it's been too dry, and we don't water. You know, it is what it is. I hope yeah. that answers the question. Uh, yeah, I've had that. I've had that problem. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Patty. I've had that problem with mine, uh, with this heat that we had a, a th down here in, in New Jersey. We had three weeks of like hot, dry weather and my yeah. well wasn't working. And it was after right right after peak of bloom and a lot went yellow, but I figured all the nutrients kind of went into making those flowers push. Yeah. And so the leaves were kind of like, eh, I need to go away. <laughs> well, and, and it could be too, if it had been really dry, that it just didn't have enough moisture and it was protecting the roots and getting rid of the the foliage to <laughs> protect yeah. the plant, dump the foliage. All right, go ahead, Patty. Um, so I think we've covered this, but just so you know, Daniel said, how important is lush foliage to the health of the blooming plant? I think we yeah. kind of covered that. Yeah, the foliage is very important. It's, it's the nutrients. Yeah. Um, someone made a comment just Saying that there's a lot of ditch lilies that the deer don't seem to eat. <laughs> They're afraid of the traffic, I guess. Well, yeah. well, there's plenty of them. It doesn't matter. You'd never yeah, know there's... that they didn't eat them. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, um, there's okay. a few questions that came in about um, dividing and separating. I don't know if you want to cover that or sure. wait. Well, what I have left now um, is I'm basically going to show you kind of how I hybridize, and we can go through that very quickly. Um, in terms of separating the plants, and I, I intended to put this in and then forgot about it. I have two really long screwdrivers mm -hmm. and a rubber mallet. <laughs> and if I dig up the clump and I wanna separate it, I look to see, and as you look at the flower, you can see how it increases, how the new plants are coming off the side. So you want to try to find a place where you're going to leave as much together as you can. So, you know, don't drive into the middle of it because you're liable to lose the plant that's just growing out. Try to find the space between the old uh where the plants are coming together. But I just take and I drive one of these screwdrivers in and then I, with the mallet, and then I put another screwdriver in right next to that one and I pull them apart. I try to get the, the ground wet that's around the plant and, and they pull apart very nicely. It keeps the roots there. Uh, and then I, I use baby powder <laughs> on any raw cuts. And for some reason there, and it may not work now that they've changed all the baby powder, but I continue to do it. There was something in baby powder that keeps the wounds from rotting. It's best to leave them out overnight and let any kind of wound you've got dry before you put it in the ground, but you can put it in the ground. And if you've got a good hardy flower, I always say, if you spent $10 on the flower, it will live no matter what you do to it. If you spent $250 on it, it will die no matter what you do to it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that sentiment, although I've never done the $200 ones. Um, one of the other things, oh, so you're also, when you're saying you're using the screwdrivers, you dig the plant, the whole plant out first yeah, and then yeah, have I it out of the, the ground. Right. Yes. And then I, one of the hints I want to give you for replanting is you dig your hole, you take a handful, small handful of, uh, um, yeah. Soil? No, pellets, uh, <laughs> alfalfa pellets. <laughs> alfalfa pellets, horse feed, okay. and you put it in a hole, you smoosh them around a little bit, fill the hole with water, and then put the plant back in and put the dirt back in. And you will be amazed the difference that makes. I'm gonna try that. Huh? Oh yeah, and the, the, the alfalfa pellets are incredibly cheap. You go to a feed store and buy those. <laughs> okay. Um, I see one more question because I know we have about 10, we're about 12 minutes before eight. So yeah. just to give you a time frame, um, Denise is asking what can be done to encourage the dailies to bloom throughout the summer, which you kind of answered, but I think it needs to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, the, uh, it, 
water. They love water. Mm -hmm. And then, it, you know, you, you do need to make sure you've got good soil. But mostly the plant will determine, you know, the scape and all of that will determine how long it's going to bloom. Mm -hmm. But like the rebloomers, the Stella de Oros, or those that keep yeah. producing new growth, that's a different. Yep. yep. That will water. water is generally the key with daylilies. And Sandy, well, since you hybridize, I don't know if you find, do you find that with the seed pods, if it produces those little seed pods, um, if you cut the scape off while it's still green before it goes tan, if you cut that off, do you think that encourages anything more um, or not really? Like I haven't, have, I've not observed that. Okay. You know, I, I, people say don't ever set pods on your first year blooms. I set pods on my first year blooms. You know, okay. it's just, that's what I eat. You do whatever works for you and it works in my area. It might not work in another. Okay. And, oh, I guess there was one more. Uh, Rochelle, Rochelle uh, was asking, why would, would you throw away a plant and do you fertilize them? Um, I, I evaluate the plants first in the seedling field. And if it does well in the seedling field and I take it out and I, at, at during the third year and I put it in a display area where it's got lots and lots of room. The uh, seedling field, everything starts out about six inches apart and the clumps are generally a foot apart when I dig them out, which means that the strongest survive. They just, they overwhelm the weak ones and you know, they're gone. And then after they've bloomed, in the display area where they have plenty of room, if they have good branching, good foliage, a nice flower, then I take them out and I cut them up into singles and put them in a line out area where they get their last evaluation. And if they can survive being cut up and still come back and look good, then they generally get introduced. But in terms of lots of fertilizer, the only thing that gets alfalfa pellets as I move them. And in the seedling fields, they don't even get that. The seedling fields, the only fertilizer is the generation before that got tilled under. Does that answer the question, do you think? I think so, and I'm sure we'll, we'll hear, but I'll let you go ahead and um, I'd love people to see um, all the different uh, things that you're working on as well as you know, see yeah. the differences. And then there was a question about sources and we can talk that at the end. Okay. I'm going to go through this really fast because I've talked longer than I planned. <laughs> oh, okay, no, you're good. We're, we start everything inside generally just around Christmas time. And then we put them outside to harden off. And as you can see, they got snowed on. And then they go into the seedling field the first summer and they bloom the second. And we, we just till it up. We put down landscape fabric because it helps to control all the weeds. And you can see there, there's the little things that come out and they are very, very close together. They go in the ground. We find that this gives us, it warms the soil in the spring. So the new seedlings, because there was nothing there dead the year before, will bloom a little earlier. And it, it we found the landscape fabric is just really, really good for us. We use very few chemicals. We figure that, you know, if we've got a little bit of something in the spring, the beneficial insects will come and get it and we just deal with it. We don't worry about thrip damage and all that kind of stuff. We do use lawn trill because we have problems with thistle blowing in because we're in a farming area. It will kill the thistle, but not the daylilies. But if you've got daisies, look out. And then we also use snapshot for grass because once the grass gets in there, you just can't get it out. And you can see that the difference in the roots where the snapshot was used. We consider the only mulch we get is if it snows. The uh, picture shows what it looks like on a day when it was 18 degrees. They get what they get. If they die, they die. And then that's just a picture of bloom in the summer. I'm going to keep going because I don't think that there's too many questions on that. And then I started playing around in 94 and really got serious about unusual forms. Everything is at the farm. That's just a picture of the seedling fields and some of the display areas. Everybody who wants to hybridize needs a mentor. 
And it doesn't matter if it's somebody you talk to over the phone, you need somebody to ask questions to. So if you're going to get into that, I encourage you to find a mentor. Nobody gets where they are without the help of somebody else. You start with somebody else's flowers, even though you eventually make them your own. And then this is the next section is what do you get when you put two things together? We already the cat when you put him with a pole and you get a pole cat. <laughs> This is my best example here. This big old fluffy thing with all the edge and it was almost UFE. I crossed it with this flower over here, uh, right there. It's kind of a pattern. Got these two were the best. And then this one, I ended up getting crossed back on a round roughly thing. These two flowers are the parents of that one. These two flowers are the parents of this one. Now here's the kids. Have you ever seen a variety? So people go, I bought a seed from such and such for this and it doesn't look anything like it. Well, if I told you that this flower came out of the same seed pod as that flower and that flower, you wouldn't believe me, but it did. Mm -hmm. And then this flower was very evergreen. This flower has a wonderful scape and is very dormant. So I cross them together. Again, these are the parents of both flowers at the bottom. This is what I got. Wow. And not one of those flowers was a keeper. They were all tilled under. <laughs> okay, here's this one. Toothy thing crossed with a toothy thing. We got all three of these. They look a lot alike. But then we also got this, <laughs> these two. <laughs> so. It's not an exact science. Now, this was my weirdest one. You can see here, this one was crossed with something with no picture, we got this flower. No pictures, we got this flower. This one and this one produced that. This was one that the tag got lost, so I have no idea where it came from. These two ultimately became this one, these two became that one. Crossed them together, got those two. And I would never have believed it until I went backwards into the genetics, because I thought maybe I had just written down the wrong cross. But those are full sibs from the same seed pod. This flower right here, Wanda Evans, took 12 years to develop. Everything in there was a seedling, except I think this was an introduced flower and then Ted Skinwalker. I got my flowers just so big and I couldn't get them bigger. <clears throat> and Skinwalker is not hardy in our area. But I bought the Tet version, and this little flower here is the hardiest thing in the whole world, and it's produced wonderful babies. This is one of the babies, Hope Hunt. This is another flower that came out of Divine Inspiration, which is a Dorakian flower. Crossed those two together and got this one and this one. Again, exact same parents, but you wouldn't believe it. This thing is four feet tall. This one is probably. 32 inches, same parents. So I always say, you know, if you want a good plant, you've got to cross on a good plant. So you might take a pollen from a plant that's not quite as good, but always put it on a good one. And then I break my rules. So I put a five inch flower with 12 inches, a 12 inch bud, a five bud flower with 12 inch scape. There we go. And I crossed and made 156 seeds with it. This is one of the kids, another kid. This one I really liked because of the edges and the eye, another kid. And then this one is a, uh, another one that I really liked. I like the little thumbprint thing here, but that's what I was trying to get. And I got a bunch of really bad plants, but I got two or three that were very good. And then this is another one. This is my little evergreen one I showed you a little earlier, crossed with that and got this flower. And it made all kinds of funky kids. I crossed it back with another one here. You can see we got the little thumbprint again. It's got a, well, we call it a blue eye. You know, daylilies aren't blue. <laughs> and then here's a bunch more kids that came from the, this cross. So here's the two parents, here's the kids. All as different as can be. I do uh, large UFs, and I'm going to go through this really fast. This is the mama, this is the daddy on all of these pictures I'm going to show you. 
So you look here and here, and I got this. You wouldn't believe it, but that's what I got. These two, I love this little thing in the eye here, and I managed to capture it on both the petals and the sepals on this flower. This one I thought was very pretty here, but if you look down here, see this kind of, I always call it, looks like wiggle worms on the back, and it's the little dots on the front. So this is kind of unique. It was, it's called stippling. Another one across the big yellow, and this is a small flower and got this thing with the, the lavender in it that's really pretty. I'm sorry, but I don't mean to brag on my daylilies, but I like them. <laughs> these two produce this one. These two, is, I didn't have a picture, but here's the two parents of the one that was the mama. This is the daddy, and I ended up with a much bigger flower in a, a kind of a funky kind of color. I always call it kind of an apricot and, and a purplish color. Now, for people that really, really like patterns, this one is very stable. It was every time it bloomed this summer, it was very stable. Here we got a little trip damage for anybody who's interested. And then this one, where the color came from, I do not know, and I have never run it backwards, but this should not have had this pattern, but it did. This is another one, just a, a nice little pattern here. It, we didn't get the little arrows there. This is another, these are smaller flowers here. I love the uh, the veining in this. I think I, I've just always been drawn to veining. Thought this one was kind of pretty with the big watermark in it. And then it, the watermark carries out here and it's got the purple on the edges and little white, or purple on the ends and little white edges. This is a big old skinny thing with a an eye in it. And there's a kid from it. Another one, this, this was a really good parent for me, but it didn't get the bud count. It got plowed under before I noticed the kids. This one is pollied, but it's got all kinds of thrip damage. And if it's real susceptible to thrips, I'll end up throwing it away no matter what it looks like. I, I give it, you know, it. I always say the first week of the, the bloom season, in the early stuff, if it's got thrips, I don't worry about it. But if I'm seeing thrips in the middle of summer, the plant's too susceptible and I pitch it. It's just another kind of pinky one. This was my favorite flower of last year. It, it was on a great big tall scape and I've got a bajillion kids coming from it next year. And then I like daylilies that move and this is gonna be very short. But you can see how this is all twisted up this is a great big flower. It's probably about 11 inches if you stretched it out. I like this really dark purple one. <laughs> There's a spatula, but it's not on all. Oh. Well, sorry about the phone. Oh, that's okay. Uh, and then this one again has just got a nice kind of eye pattern in it. And then I think I, you remember this one, I showed it to you earlier, crossed it into a bigger flower and we ended up with kind of an eye. It's a reverse bitone, whoops. And it's red, but this one was, I thought this one was very interesting. I hope that it, it does well. It bloomed for the first time this year. This one is about four feet tall and it's a really unique color in the garden. And then this one, I, I love the way this one twists around. I think it got a pink twisty, and a purple twisty with a little bit of a watermark, another watermark. And then they, these are what I call my special day lilies. This one, you know, I talked about how I evaluate them. This flower won the stout, and my dear friend Steve Moldovan was here just before he passed away. He was here like the weekend before he passed away, and he got out of the car, and he he just loved this flower. He said, I hate every color in it, but boy, I love that flower, and it didn't have the branching I wanted, and it was the last year for it in the display, and I left it another year, and the following year, it was branched like a tree, so 
you have to be careful when you have really strict rules. You might end up throwing out a stout winner. <laughs> this is the one I named for my father, and it, uh, it's just a huge flower. I mean, the people who grow it just, you know, I, I get pictures from them all the time going, I can't believe how big it is. We, I, when I lined it out, we had the, the, I don't know, 40 mile an hour winds or something. And they, all the scapes were up. They were single fans. They were probably in as much jeopardy as they would ever be. And only two fans or only two scapes were on the ground when it was over. And then I've showed you Wanda before. It's the best parent I've ever had. And this silly little flower is Tidewater L. And it's branched like a tree. I have a bunch of crazy friends in Atlanta who do exhibitions and they compete with one another like crazy. And I get these calls, my Tidewater Elf beat out such and such Tidewater Elf at the show. And then it reverses the next show that's the difference. But this one is one of those flowers that just blooms and blooms and blooms. And then this is my biggest flower. It has a 14 inch wingspan and it stands about three and a half feet tall. So it's huge. <laughs> and uh, the best advice I got from Steve was, you know, you only get about one in a thousand if you're going to introduce. So you got to be careful, be real picky, and you might do better. And always cross your best flower on your best plant. And I did not do that for a number of years. And I had some very pretty faces on plants I had to throw away. Okay. Okay, so I want to, uh, well, I, lo I love that one. Um, I have your, uh, no, that's somebody else's. Any case, I wanted to thank, uh, there's still uh, quite a few people online. So I wanted to thank everybody since it is after eight, you're welcome to stay on and we'll we'll talk and everything, but I want to give people uh, a chance to um, to pop off if they need to. Uh, we will have a, um, a garden program uh, next in November on the 16th on Garden Railroads. Yes, 16th, right? 1 6, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, at 7 p.m. So if you'd like to join, you can join on our website and we'll be sending out links. Um, but I also wanted to um, thank Sandy uh, for coming on for this particular program. But we also, um, in New Jersey here, we have a Garden State Daily Grower um, Club, a Daily Club with the AHS. And um, Sandy is going to be speaking with us on Sunday more about her hybridizing. So if anybody's interested, you can always send an email back to um, to me and we can um, get you some information if you'd like to join us on that one. Uh, there was one particular question, Sandy, that um, popped on and you kind of answered it, but I'm not sure if the person wasn't um, didn't see that you had the parents. It says, okay. if I grow a daily from a seed pod, will the uh -huh. same color flower show up? Which no, you know, <laughs> no, nope. um, maybe, but not likely. <laughs> no. And and it does say it sounds like a tiffy, and it is. Um, but how do you cross pollinate? So I know we didn't really talk a whole lot about yeah. that part. What I do, I'm always looking to make a different, unusual form. So I tend not to hybridize like the average individual. The average individual, I'm going to pretend, wants to do round, roughly flowers. They buy two round, roughly flowers that they like in a color that they like, and they put them together and take the prettiest flower with the best plant. I take my favorite big UF and I cross it on maybe a round, roughly flower so that I can get a great big, skinny, roughly flower. And so I tend to get a whole lot more diversity in my seedlings than maybe the average individual. There are people that, that hybridize, that, that they do what they call line breeding. You know, they, they started out with six parents and now they've got, you know, we'll, we'll pretend they've got 40 daylilies, but all go back in some way to those six parents. And so the chances of getting daylilies that are, are more consistent in color or form or things like that is far greater for somebody like that than it is for me because I throw away so much stuff that just, you know, it's, it's not as big as I want 
or it's got a big flower and a short scape. And I knew when I put them together, that could happen. Does that answer the question? I think that does. I think yeah. that's the big thing. And you're taking pollen from basically you're taking the pollen from one plant and putting it in a pistil of the other. And yeah. then you're saving that seed pod so you can plant it the following year. Yeah. Um, for those people that may not be as familiar with the process. Yeah. Um, I, I love uh, Lynn also uh, had asked, um, when should you divide daylilies? Do you have a preference? I know you're a zone six, we're zone seven here on the coast of Jersey. Yeah. What's your preference? I'm dividing daylilies right now. <laughs> I, I don't like to go much after the middle of October. Um, you can do them in the summer when it's really hot, but there tend to be more stress. Uh, I would say September to mid October is is a good time for me. Um, you can do them in the spring too, but you'll find that your scapes will be shorter and you won't have as many blooms. Just for that year. That. Yeah, just that year. But you can do daylilies just about any time of the year. They truly are hardy flowers. Okay. Um, did you see any I missed, Patty, in particular? Some great. Um, I just a lot of comments. They are amazing, which they were. It's like a <laughs> fireworks show at the end. It was <laughs> awesome. Um, let's see. Someone saying they appreciate Sandy's expertise and willingness to share her knowledge. Well, great seminar. Thank you. Um, can I buy plants from you? Oh yes. That's, there's a question. Yeah. <laughs> And we can we can send uh yeah if you don't have your um, website up um Sandy we can send I can send it out to her directly since I know as as a Rutgers you know we don't promote yeah. one person or another but there are quite a few um, daily you know if you're trying to get the unusual dailies yes oh, you may want to yeah. do a personal website versus going to Home Depot or or box yeah. store um, the garden right. centers will bring in depending on what's in their area or who's growing what but you yeah. will tend to find the common. <laughs> Uh, once I so, always say yeah. the stuff in the garden center is 20 years old. Yes, the stuff you buy from the hybridizers was probably developed five to 10 years before. Um, we have a website, it's Riverbend Daylily Garden. If you want to search it, I believe it's day, uh, daylily.ws is our, our website. But uh, if you search Riverbend Daylily Gardens, you can see what we have. My husband does entirely different stuff than I do. And uh, uh, I just found it amazing that from when, uh, you know, they were hybridizing in 1940 to what's out there now. Yeah. It seemed like what the 70s and 80s were really the hot hotbed for daylily breeding, would this, you say? The 70s and 80s. The 70s especially was a very controversial time because tetraploids were coming into their own. Okay. And the traditional hybridizers who did diploids uh, were, you know, the tetraploids will never last, you know, and it, it was a very controversial time. But the tetraploids then were much bigger and sturdier than the diploids. So they they were very popular. The diploids today, are nothing like they were back then. The diploids a day are every bit as, as I call them as nice as the tetraploids. You you put them next to one another, you can't tell the difference. But the diploids back then were, were the tetraploids back then were much bigger, stronger looking flowers and plants. And actually, I'm glad you brought that up because um, our daily club, the Garden State Daily Growers, um, we actually have a garden that we are trying to make a historic display garden uh -huh. um, that has uh, over 180 plants starting in the 1900s, and it goes up to 2000 and, and beyond. And so if you guys are interested um, next season, because they are done blooming this year, and if the deer don't get them, because um, <laughs> it's a big deer problem, so we haven't been able to evaluate them to get them somebody to come judge and let us know that we're good um uh, but Rutgers was kind enough uh to allow us to um make a garden in there and be a display garden hopefully in the future uh -huh. so you can really see how much they've changed from a species to these unusual forms and everything in between it's really cool to see it all yeah. so um there will be some 70s in there to see uh <laughs> to see that difference and how much yeah. it's changed between a diploid then and a 
something now. So um, I just, this was great, Sandy. I really oh, appreciate you. that you wanted, you asked me uh, to um, see if you could uh, present and I really am glad you reached out. Uh, this was awesome. I mean, I know I'm just a day, I'm, I'm a plant geek in any case. Daylilies yeah. are our specialty or, or a favorite, but I don't hybridize. So for me, it's all about the color, the look, the size, the st all over the place. Gotcha. Um, I like that they hold their color. I like all the different terms that you used, but ah, they have to be pretty. And mine yep. don't get a lot of water. It's just what it is. Well, to be honest, mine don't either. <laughs> you know, if it rains, they get wet. If it doesn't, they get dry. <laughs> And they might sit out of the ground in the winter with no pot and roots out exposed, and it still blooms beautifully the following year. Well, not yeah. beautifully. I do have some issues, but it's not. It's still viable. Put it in the ground, and it's back to normal. It's just great. There was, I did forget, there was one question. When should, um, how often should you divide daylilies, I guess, for the, like, typical um, person? You know, and again, this is going to be a really bad answer, but it depends on the plant. There are some plants I tell people, if you have a small garden, don't buy a super vigorous plant because it's going to increase too fast and you're going to run out of room. Buy something that instead of putting out four fans every year, puts out one. So if you have something that puts out four fans every year, you will notice over time that the bloom, you don't get as much bloom and the flowers are smaller. And when you start to see that happen you've gone too long you probably should have taken care of splitting things up the year before but you just have to go by the size of the clump i always tell small gardeners you know don't go buy something that you know triples every three years because you'll run out of room and you don't want to dig it up every three years so that's not an answer, but it's kind of an answer. You know, ask before you buy it, ask how much it increases, and then you'll have an idea whether you're going to have to dig into it at the end of three years or 10. <laughs> and for the, like, if, if you're going to hybridize or, or want to know, you know, if you're ordering something online, you can actually speak to the people that grow it yes. versus if you're buying at a garden center, if you're buying local, um, you would want to look at the type of, pot that it's in you know if you've got what we call fans the growing points if you've got six or seven or eight in a pot and it's really tight that one's probably going to be one that increases a little bit faster than yeah. saying it's brethren that's only got two or three fans in that so um to start so if that helps people to uh pick and choose <laughs> yeah. and so. one you've got to be careful too at the garden centers because like the uh, the big box stores they're buying their daylilies in mass and a lot of them have probably been what I call mass produced. And it could be that they've used BAP and things like that on them to make them increase. And they don't always increase true. So I would just, I'm not saying not to buy them there. The average individual, it's perfectly fine. But if you're a collector and you, you go in and you see, oh gee, there's such and such that I've always wanted, you may not be getting it. <laughs> but if you buy it from somebody who, who grows day lilies you'll be you, you'll be a lot more sure that you're getting the right day lilies and you can probably get them at the same price you get them in the, the uh, big box stores so and you get more personal touch yeah <laughs> yeah um, I do want to, somebody did have a question where the garden was located. The garden um, is located at the Rutgers Garden in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, so it's right near the Rutgers main campus in New Brunswick. So if anybody has any questions, let me know. We can, uh, that's, you know, kind of separate from my job from here. But I just wanted to let people know that there are places, if you're in a different state, there may be display gardens um, in your yeah. state that you can visit and you would want to look at the American, uh, well, it's called the American Daily Society, where you can look up American Hemocallus. It's the same. They changed the name um, like a couple of years, two years ago or so. Um, so, um, you know, if you have any questions, send them my way uh, or send them our way and uh, we will get those answers to you. But I really want to thank you, Sandy, so much for coming on. This was great. Um, it was better than basic um, and not but easy to understand, which it was perfect. So, oh, good. yep. Yeah, so I want to thank you. Thank you so much. And um, so I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. Okay.